Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Frank McQuillan from Pivotal, and it's a pleasure to be here to speak with you about uh, machine learning. Um, so I work in product management at uh, Pivotal. I've been there since Pivotal started about three and a half years ago. Before that, I spent about five years at Yahoo. <clears throat> um, and my focus area really is on tools for data science and analytics, of which Apache Madlib is one of the ones that I uh, work on, which is <clears throat> the, the topic for today. But I'd like to start with a quote from somebody we all know and love, or at least know. Um, and when I looked this up, I saw that this quote is um, five years old, which I thought is a little bit dated at this point. So uh, I thought I would modernize it uh, a little bit and say that uh, machine learning is, in fact, eating the world. If you read the popular press and the specialty press, what you see is that all the soothsayers and people are talking about uh, machine learning. And <clears throat> in fact, if you go to Google Trends and look at trends for software and machine learning, it looks like this. Now, software is a general term, so we, let's not read too much into this. But the point is on machine learning, artificial intelligence, um, deep learning, in the last year or two, you're seeing a market increase in usage of these terms. So there's a trend of sorts, although we never see any units on the y-axis of these Google trends. I don't know exactly what it means. Um, but it seems like there's more interest, right? So um, you know, I don't know if machine learning is going um, mainstream per se, but what we have observed at Pivotal in the last year or so is that our customers are starting to ask more and more about it, about how to incorporate machine learning into their day-to-day -day business. So they have existing investments in, in their tech stack, the people that they've trained, um, and they're saying, hey, we want to add a data science component to this. What are our, our options? And you know, what are the technologies that are relevant to um, uh, to this for us. Um, so really it's kind of about the enterprise. That's how I'm sort of reading this uh, interest in machine learning, which is going beyond academic projects, beyond Skunk Works projects and, uh, and POCs. And people are actually trying to use this to improve their products and services that they bring to their um, customers. Um, so, you know, SQL is really a key aspect here because a lot of these enterprises have data existing in relational form in, in uh, databases like Postgres. And in fact, Postgres is very well positioned to participate here because of the PL language support, right, for PLR, PL Python, and the associated data science libraries um, that go along with that. So the idea um, behind Apache Matlab and some of the other work that's going on uh, now in this area is how can you bring machine learning to where the, the data is? So that's what I would like to, to speak to you about today, um, specifically on this um, project called Apache Madlib. And by way of agenda, what I thought I would do um, is give you an introduction to, to Apache Madlib for folks who are not familiar with it, describe a little bit how it works, but not go into too much detail, um, give you a demo of some of the new features that have been added in the last couple of releases, and then describe the future plans, our roadmap, and what we're hearing from the community about um, where people would like to go with this, uh, with this project. Okay. So, um, first of all, what is uh, Apache Madlib? Uh, it's an open source machine learning library. It runs in database, it runs on Greenplum database, it runs on Apache Hawk, um, and it runs in Postgres. Uh, Apache Hawk, there's a commercial product called Pivotal HD, HDB. It's a SQL on Hadoop product, which is kind of based on Greenplum technology, but based on Postgres technology. Um, but again, the idea is that we want to do operations within the database at scale 
um, as opposed to you know, moving the database, moving data out of the database, operating it on it in some other execution engine, and then moving it back. Uh, so we want to do this in place computation. And I guess the main characteristics of Madlib, if I was to kind of summarize them, are their scalability and performance. If the data that you want to operate on fits in memory in a single node, <clears throat> then there's a lot of other options out there for you. Um, there's commercial options like SAS, like SPSS, um, a wide variety of these. There's open source, a lot of open source options and great libraries like uh, R and the Python libraries I mentioned like scikit-learn, pandas, etc. cetera. Um, but if you have very large data sets and you want to operate on them at scale on a cluster, that's what Madlib was conceived uh, for initially. And if you want to do it in a performant uh, manner, so you don't want your queries to run all night. This is... Um, a list of some of the <clears throat> principal uh, functions within Madlib today. And it's a pretty mature library. Um, I would say it's been around for about five years. I have a history chart here in a second. Um, so it kind of covers a lot of the supervised, unsupervised learning algorithms that you would use, as well as, um, so you see, I mean, even for folks who are not that involved in data science and analytics, you see some familiar terms here like regression, linear regression, logistic regression. Um, you see trees, decision trees, random forest is like an ensemble of collections of, of decision trees. Um, you see clustering, k-means is a popular clustering algorithm. So you see support vector machines as well as a classic way to do regression and um, um, classification. So you see um, you know, a bunch of these algorithms. You see also a lot in the area of statistics, both district descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. An example on descriptive statistics is like approximate unique counts because that can be an exp expensive computation. So there's algorithms there to get um, approximate unique counts within some sort of bounded uh, error. Um, inferential statistics like hypothesis, hypothesis tests are used a lot in, by some of our health, sci health science kinds of customers. So in addition, in the last uh, year or so, we've spent more time on utility modules. Um, and that's because um, <clears throat> data scientists tend to spend a lot of time working on data prepare, to prepare it for input into predictive analytics algorithms. So um, we want to make it easier for them to do that. Right, so we've done a lot more in the area of these utility modules. Things like doing sessionization and pivoting and path kinds of functions. And I'll demonstrate these in a, in a little bit. So it's a pretty comprehensive library. It's not like as many functions as SAS, but SAS is extremely expensive. Um, so in fact, we have a lot of customers that we are talking to now who use SAS but are looking for other open source alternatives. So they're looking at you know, PL languages in uh, Postgres, for example. They're looking at open source projects like um, Apache Madlib. They're looking at Spark and MLlib and the data science capability there. So to kind of summarize the, or to outline the features um, of Madlib that are important, parallelism is important. Um, so the algorithms within Madlib are distributed across segments, right? They take advantage of a massively parallel processing architecture, this idea of an MPP architecture. And this is done on an algorithm by algorithm basis. So this is sort of the art and science of the, of the work in which um, the team that I work with looks at you know, a particular algorithm, algorithm of interest and figures out how to realize that algorithm in a distributed manner. And it's not easy to do um, because you can't automatically, as you guys I'm sure know, you folks I'm sure know, automatically distribute an algorithm to work in parallel. Um, it needs to be done on a case-by-case -case basis for the most part. And different, de different algorithms result in different degrees of parallelism. For example, time series is much harder to parallelize than um, 
other predictive algorithms like logistic regression, for example. Um, scalability is another important factor. The idea of being able to add nodes as your data set scales, or if you want a faster execution time, add more nodes without having to change your software. So, um, yes, please. The MPP architecture is a Greenplum or Apache Hawk kind of architecture. Um, it does run in Postgres as well, um, but uh, the MPP single node. single node Postgres. And yes. No way to, like, nodes well, I just sat through um, a Postgres XL um, talk, so it would be interesting maybe from if somebody from that community took a look at what the port to of Madlib to Postgres XL might look like. Um, yeah, I'm, when I'm talking about MPP, I'm talking about a architecture like Greenplum, which is designed for multi-node execution. Yeah, there was there was a please go ahead. <laughs> yes. Um, well, it wouldn't be a distributed implementation on a single node Postgres, right? So it would, it, it's not like it would distribute the algorithms across the cores and run it in parallel, but it would take, to the extent that Postgres takes advantage, in the regular ex query execution, takes advantage of the underlying CPU, then, you know, Madlib doesn't do anything special with that. There was actually a port to uh, Impala a couple years ago that was started, and um, I haven't heard too much about it uh, lately. But the idea of scalability really is on, um, you know, associated with MPP or distributed architectures. Yeah. Um, but on, actually, on the idea of scalability, we do have, um, you know, users who develop on Postgres. And then you can deploy it at scale on the cluster, right? So it doesn't, it means you're not changing any of the software. So if you do some development on a single node Postgres and then you want to deploy it um, into a larger cluster, that software doesn't, doesn't change, right? It's deployed, excuse me, across the cluster and then it takes advantage of the parallel um, architecture. Yes, please. Yes. How to uh, how to split that inside of this uh, for the multi node execution? Right. Um, so I have a couple of slides on that coming up. But algorithms like k-means that are are iterative, then have a process by which the data is gathered at um, the master node, and there's multiple iterations to convergence. Right. So if you don't if you don't have a closed form solution, um, and k-means is an example of an iterative solution, then um, it runs through transition, merge, and final functions multiple times to convergence. Compared to a say, linear regression, which has a closed form solution, and that would um, you know, not require iterative processing. But I have a picture of that uh, coming up to go into a bit more detail. Um, so on the, way, on the area of better predictive accuracy, the data scientists that we work with want to use all of the data. They don't want to sample the data because um, that can lead to um, you know, less um, predictive um, accuracy in their models, right? So some, sometimes sampling is fine. There are cases in which you have large data sets, but if you have like high cardinality dimensions like user ID and you're trying to do models by user, um, then you can find out that you end up with fairly sparse data per user if you're sampling. So the data scientists that we work with, um, both in-house at Pivotal as well as our customers, tend to want to use all of the, the data. And the final point is that um, Madlib is open source in the Apache Software Foundation. Um, so it's community-driven 
um, development. And I think we all know the value of doing open source uh, development at this conference. So a little bit more on the, the history. I thought I would draw a timeline out here um, to kind of show where Madlib uh, came from. It actually has a fairly long pedigree tied to, to Postgres, right? So as we all know, Stonebreaker started this work in, at UC Berkeley in the mid 90s. Um, and in 2005, um, a company called Greenplum at the time forked Postgres in the 8.2 uh, version. So there was um, kind of development of the MPP architecture on top of Postgres 8.2. 8 and then around 2011, um, Joe Hellerstein at Berkeley and some of the folks at um, Greenplum at the time were saying, you know, we have all of this data in this great massively parallel processing engine. How can we take advantage of that? How can we do data science on, on that? Um, so that was sort of the impetus for the creation of Madlib in 2011. Uh, Madlib has always been an open source project. It was a um, uh, BSD license project until last year when it was moved to Apache Software Foundation. Um, but you can see between 2011 and 2015, you know, there's four to five uh, years of development um, before, it, before the software was granted to Apache Software Foundation. So along the way, around 2012, that's when Apache Hawk came in, or at least initially it was called Hawk. Um, that is uh, kind of the idea with that was to take the MPP architecture of Greenplum, but to do it on the Hadoop file system instead of local, local storage, right? So it has a lot of the characteristics and pedigree, if you will, from Greenplum database, um, but it's in a HDFS, in a um, Hadoop uh, kind of ecosystem. So all of these projects now are um, open source. Um, you know, Greenplum, Apache Hawk, and uh, Madlib, of course, are all open source uh, projects. So that's a little bit about the history. Um, this project has really benefited a lot from our interaction with uh, various academic institutions. I mentioned Joe Hellerstein at Berkeley. He was kind of one of the initial folks that, was, that started working on this. Um, we've also worked with Stanford University. Um, University of Wisconsin-Madison has been a great partner. In fact, the convex optimization um, components within um, Madlib originally came from uh, Wisconsin-Madison. In some of the graph work that we're starting to do now, um, there was academic work done at, uh, by Jignesh Patel at Wisconsin-Madison that we're sort of basing that on, uh, as well as University of Florida, right? So it's been a good interaction between industry and uh, academic participation. So these are the supported platforms, as I, as I mentioned. Um, and <clears throat> so these are all open source um, projects. Uh, so what I thought I would do now is just spend a very short amount of time talking about an MPP architecture uh, for folks who perhaps are, haven't seen um, that, and I'll use Greenplum database uh, as an example there. So um, this is kind of a high-level architecture of what Greenplum looks like. So we have a SQL que query coming in from a client. <coughs> it, <coughs> it comes to a, a master, which may have a mirror backup. Um, so the query processor within uh, the master then will dispatch the queries you know, to the various segment servers. So in the lexicon here, segment is like a worker node, right? So this is where the query execution um, takes place, right? So it's dispatched on the master uh, across, the inter uh, across the network interconnect and the actual computation takes place um, on the, the segments. Uh, when you're loading data in, you wanna load the data in in a parallel way so loading from external sources generally goes 
to the worker nodes themselves as opposed to coming through bottleneck at the master. So this is kind of a very high level description of what a distributed um, database uh, looks like for, for Greenplum. In the case of MATLAB, you can think of MATLAB as kind of a layer on this, if you will. So MATLAB has its SQL based, it also has an R interface, um, as well as a kind of nascent Python interface. So um, input validation and pre-processing kind of happens in MATLAB. I'll show you the stack in a, in a minute. Um, and then in database functions are, are invoked for machine learning, statistics, math, and uh, utilities, right? So MATLAB is built kind of on top of Greenplum and it takes advantage of the query processing, the cost-based query processing um, in, um, in Greenplum as well as all the great underlying Postgres uh, technology. One really key aspect to um, <coughs> Greenplum database is the query optimizer. This is open source as well. <coughs> and it represents a fairly significant investment over like four to five years, starting at EMC Greenplum and EMC Greenplum. Um, and it's a cost-based optimizer. So it applies this kind of broad set of optimization strategies depending on the, the query, considers multiple plan alternatives, um, and considers you know, memory usage as well, and then it dispatches the queries to the, uh, um, the segments for, uh, for execution. All right. So there's a fair amount, there's a couple of papers out there, probably more than a couple, on the details of this query optimizer. So if this is a kind of area that's of interest to you, then I encourage you to, to uh, check it out. Um, so this is the last sort of part on uh, Greenplum. Greenplum kind of con consists of more than query execution. There are other aspects to it as well. For example, there's a number of third party vendors that certify their tools to run in Greenplum. Like I mentioned SAS. SAS is a, um, a scoring module that works well in Greenplum. Um, there's a lot of BI tools like Tableau and um, Pentaho and Spotfire and such that have connectors to, to Greenplum. Um, there is um, some other tools that Greenplum users can use, like workload managers and such, which are not open source. Those are, are more kind of query management kinds of tools. So it's fairly comprehensive in terms of capability of this, this database for production, uh, production use. I'd like to go back now to, to Madlib and talk a little bit about scalability that, that I mentioned before. So one of the things that we think a lot about is, is how the algorithms scale. Because um, as I mentioned before, if the algorithms don't scale well, then there's a lot of other options for users to, to, to try for, to, to use. So what we do when we build a new algorithm is we think about what the main parameters of, of interest are. Data size is obviously one of them, but there are others as well. And we ensure that we have linear, well, we try for linear or sublinear scalability of the algorithms, but it really depends on what they are. It's not always linear and sublinear, um, but at least we want to understand and publish scalability. Because a lot of times, um, you know, we will have users on the mailing list or what have you say, hey, this doesn't work, what's going on? So we want to be able to, to look at our scalability um, numbers and say, okay, it's you know, maybe because of this is happening or that is happening. So I have a couple of examples here just to show you of the kinds of things that we do. This is um, linear regression. So this is one of those, this is not an iterative solution. There's like a closed form solution for this. Um, and it shows the execution time here on um, an eight node cluster. And the green line is Green Plum Database and the uh, the, the red line is Apache Hawk, right? So it shows this is 1 million, 10 million, and 100 million uh, 
records, rows in the database, right? So it's showing kind of more or less linear scalability uh, with um, number of, with size of data. Here's another one for logistic regression. So you can see now instead of talking 25 to 50 seconds, we're talking about, yes, question. Um, there's, there's, work, there's work right now that's going on on code generation, which is kind of just-in-time computation. It's not in the versions that we ran on here, um, but the query optimizer team is currently working on code gen as um, part of a future re release. It's, yeah, it's generally implemented in C. Yes. Uh, room for improvement? I'm, there definitely is, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, some of the, there was actually a pull request last week on mini batching to address, partly address what you're talking about now. Cause, yeah, because most of the algorithms, not all of them, most of them are, out, are operating on tuple by, the transition function is operating, operating tuple by tuple. Um, but there was a pull request last week for a multi-class support vector machine, SVM, um, in which the implementation is, is um, doing mini batching on the transition function. Uh, with pretty impressive performance improvements. So kind of depending how that goes, we're interested in rolling that out to some of the other algorithms here. And that's also going to be very useful for things like um, deep learning to do it on batches that you can send to a GPU. Yeah, good question. Um, so logistic regression, uh, the times are much longer now, like 400, 500 seconds, because this is an iterative uh, algorithm. Again, this is showing you know, 1 million, 10 million, 100 million rows, um, more or less linear scalability. This is um, support vector machines. This is classification. Um, and it sh this now is against number of features. So this is execution time against feature vector, right? So features is the way that data scientists talk about independent variables. Um, so as you go from, uh, this is probably 10 or 110 maybe, 100 to 1,000, um, you can see that you've got not quite linear scalability. I don't know if there's intermediate data points here that are not plotted. Um, but at least the point is, scalability is important and we want to understand it. Um, so I'd like to go a little bit more into um, usage uh, before we, we do a demo here. So this is, it's SQL based, so this is what, the, what it looks like. Here we're doing linear regression, so we're, it's you know, explicit function call within a select statement, right? So selecting linear regression um, and we're giving the input parameters which are uh, an input table. So we're doing the thing called the training, which is training the predictive model. Um, linear regression is, I'm sure you folks remember from high school math, plotting a straight line between um, points to minimize, um, say, the error, or the distance between those points in some aggregate way. Regression is, and higher dimensions is basically the same thing, it's the same kind of thing. Um, so we have an input table, we have an output table where our model is going to live. In this case, we want to predict the price of a house. And these are the features that we're going to give. Um, you know, what, property, what your property tax is, number of bathrooms, the size and square feet of your square meters of your house. Um, and in this case, I'm grouping by bedroom. So I want to, this is actually one interesting thing you can do by virtue of the, the fact that it's in SQL, is you can build multiple models at the same time. So this will go ahead and build uh, a separate model for each number of bedrooms that you have. So if you have a two bedroom house, a three bedroom house, a four bedroom house, um, it will build a separate model for each of those if that's what you wanted. If you didn't, 
want that, then you would just remove that and it would build a single model over the whole data set. Um, the complement to, tra to training a model is prediction. Right, so we have this model, we're gonna give it new data. How will it predict house sales? So for every training function, there's an associated prediction function. And we're giving it the, the model, which is in our houses out. We're giving our model here. You were using the coefficients of that model in order to, to do the prediction on house uh, prices. So this is sort of what the um, usage looks like from PSQL or whatever notebook that you're using. Um, a little bit more on kind of the execution flow now. So um, you have a client here, which could be PSQL or a lot of data, data scientists that we work with like to use notebooks like Jupyter Notebook or Apache Zeppelin. So the SQL comes to the database server that calls a stored procedure, um, which runs in the master process. And then um, so use this, uses this idea of um, aggregation. And aggregations then run on each of the, uh, the segments, right? That's the distribution uh, functions, which I'll show in a, in a second. So this is sort of the, so there's iteration that happens here if it's an iterative function, the result set comes back to the database server and, and is returned to the, the client, right? So this is kind of the high level execution flow. So if we were to drill a little bit more detail into what's happening kind of over here on the right side. So we have, um, so we have a stored procedure for the, the model Right, so the stored procedure is um, a set of procedural statements that are stored in the database server invoked by SQL. In this case, this is like a generic model one. It's initializing this model. While the model hasn't converged, then it's gonna call this uh, aggregation function. So what does this aggregation function do? Um, the aggregation function is, it's generally written in C++. It consists of a transition, a merge, a final function. Um, and so looking at each of those in turn, the transition function then, it operates on tuples or mini batches um, to update this transition state, right? To update the model. Then um, when that's complete on each of the segments, when the segment is complete, then it runs a merge function. So the merge function runs on the master that combines the state from um, the, the segments, right? So this is, I think, more specific to an MPP architecture compared to Postgres because Postgres wouldn't have a merge um, function. The merge function is carried out by the executor and it's basically a tree which combines the states from all of the segments um, on the master. And then the third component then is to transform uh, the transition state into the kind of the output value, right? And in the case where uh, the thing hasn't converged yet, then it will broadcast, right? So it broadcasts the um, state to each of the segments. So the model is updated and then it will crunch through the tuples or the mini batches, uh, report back, merge, et cetera. And that loop will happen uh, until uh, convergence. Okay. And in the case of non-iterative, it would be one loop through. There would be no looping. This is what the stack looks like. Um, so, User interfaces, SQL, um, iteration layer, the high level iteration layer is in Python. And then the machine learning algorithms themselves are realized in, in C++. Um, that's where kind of all the machine learning logic is. And then we have an abstraction layer to talk to the C APIs of the, uh, of the database. And we use, we use a bunch of different libraries. I called out two of them here. We use C++. Uh, we use um, Eigen, 
which is a template library for things like linear algebra, uh, like matrices, vectors, numerical solvers, and such. And we use Boost as well, which is a series of C++ um, libraries um, for all sorts of things. Right? So that's sort of the kind of flow and high-level architecture. So I thought I might, at this point, do a quick demo here. So I'm going to, yeah, OK. So let's start with linear regression. So I'm going to use um, a Jupyter Notebook, which is a, a useful way of combining SQL and Python and other libraries as well. So I'm going to do, I'm going to start with uh, linear regression example for house prediction that we saw. Um, so I have this magic uh, SQL that I'm going to load. Um, this is my connection string. In this case, I'm going to connect to a local Postgres database, which is running on my, um, my laptop, which is version, looks like 9.4.5, so it's a little bit old. Um, so let's, let's, load some, let's load some data here. This is what my data table looks like that I just loaded. So this is similar to that we saw on the slide. So we have property tax, number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms in the house. This is the actual price, size of the um, house and size of the, the lot. So now I want to build a single model on the whole data set. So this looks similar, right? This is what we did before. But I don't have bedroom down here because I don't want to, I don't want to model per bedroom. Um, so let's run this. And then I'm outputting the model. So the model has a bunch of characteristics associated with it. The main ones are the coefficients, right? In this, in the um, xy plane, going back to your high school math class, this would be the slope. Um, higher dimensions, you have multiple uh, coefficients and some other statistics that go with it. Then what I can do is a prediction, right? So now I'm going to predict house prices based on, in this case, I'm kind of cheating. I'm feeding the same data back in. Normally, I would feed data in from another data set that I want to predict. Um, so I will run that. And now what I get is this was my source data and this is my predicted price. All right, so based on this linear model, um, the predicted price of this two bedroom instead of it actual was 50,000. Um, but it says that if I, my model is predicting it to be 53,000. Likewise, this was 85,000. My model is predicting it to be 109,000. It's a toy data set. So um, you know, fair amount of error there. Uh, but what I was mentioning before is now if I want to do a model by bedroom, I can do a model by bedroom. And you can see my, um, where is it? Yeah. Now what I have is I have coefficients associated with a bedroom, right? So I'm getting a different model for each bedroom. And then when I run my prediction, then I'm going to get Again, I have a predicted price for each house, but probably this predicted price is going to be different than a global model. So this predicted price is 43,000 for the first one, and the last one it was 53,000, right? The second one, um, 109,000 versus uh, 111,000, right? So it's, it's a different model for that group by, if you will. OK, so let's look at another example. This is an example of um, something called support vector machines. And support vector machines in kind of in principle, um, there's a blog post uh, here for folks that are interested in the, the Apache Madlib implementation. But the idea is for classification, you want to put a dividing line so-called hyperplane um, between two data, two sets of data, in order to classify it. Right. So if you want to class, and by um, this kind of two-state classification is very common. Like if you want to um, do, say, fraud detection, right? So fraud or not fraud, um, you know, allow a transaction, don't allow a transaction. Um, this sort of classification is very common. So the idea is. That support vector machines is this I idea of being able to put the separating plane between sets of data. And it works in other dimensions as well. So the example I wanted to show you was 
something called novelty detection. And novelty detection is used a lot in fraud. I can think of an example in, um, uh, that was used for um, medical insurance fraud in which the data was trained on, so the model was trained on the kinds of um, treatments that were given to certain, um, certain diseases, right? And that means that, you know, if you have a certain kind of injury uh, or a certain kind of ailment, then there's sort of typical treatments that you get. So if you then give uh, new data in which you see certain ailments that have different kinds or unusual kinds of treatments, then that's potentially fraud, right? So you want to find out um, if, the, if um, a treatment is so-called novel, and if it's novel, you may want to go investigate it, right? So if somebody goes in with like a sore hip and they end up with getting a nose job, that's probably potentially fraud. Uh, as an, you know, an example of an extreme example, but that was the kind of thing that novelty detection with SVM finds, can potentially find. Okay, so um, I'm going to uh, train a data set. So here are my data set. This is a toy data set, but think of the blue, I'm training it on the blue ones. So the blue ones are um, the data that is not novel. It's kind of expected. So for example, you could think of these as like the typical treatments you would get for a certain diagnosis. And there's a bunch of red ones out there, which are the outliers, which we're going to predict. Right, so the model is actually trained on the blue ones, okay? So I'm gonna create a table from that. Now I'm gonna run my SVM one class. And um, I'm gonna do it on my uh, training data. So it's gonna build that hyperplane or that this is the model itself. Um, and let me just skip ahead here and show you the picture. I'll just uh, maybe do this. Right. So when the model actually runs, it builds this so-called decision boundary. And the decision boundary is based on the data, the blue data that we trained it with. Um, so if you see data that is within that decision boundary, then it will classify that as, hey, that's not novel. We've seen that before. If you um, see data that's outside of that decision boundary, then um, you know, that is potentially, you know, could be potentially fraud, right? So um, you know, if we look at our uh, outlier um, data here, right, you can see our out some of the outlier data is actually in this uh, decision boundary, which is a, a bit kind of uh, strange. But most of the predictions are negative one. So negative one means anomalous compared to um, the d data set that it was trained on. Right. Um, maybe I'll do one other quick data uh, demo before we kind of go ahead, uh, look at the kind of uh, future work. Um, so this one is, this isn't a predictive algorithm. This is an algorithm called PATH. Uh, it's relatively, relatively new, um, added to Madlib in the last year or so. And it's very similar to Aster NPATH. There's a commercial product out there from Teradata called Aster. And they have this NPATH algorithm, um, which is you know, often used for things like um, you know, web analytics is a common one. Trading, it's used a lot in financial circles for analysis of trades. So um, one example here is if we have um, people shopping on a website, right? And these are, uh, their actions on that website are, are logged, right? So what we have is we have a timestamp, user ID, this is a session, session ID. They're shopping, so they're, they're on a landing page, they're shopping for wine, they may purchase something. This is a checkout and they purchase some data. So what we're interested in doing is finding paths through that data, right? Um, so there's something called a path function. And the path function here allows you to identify, here I'll move down to this one, for example. If we want to find, as one example, 
um, all of the sessions in which a purchase was made within four pages of entering the site, right? If somebody entered the site, they did a bunch of stuff, but they bought something within four pages, then how could you do that? Well, you could write some pretty complicated SQL to do this. Um, what you're actually trying to do is extract patterns across rows in the database, in the table, um, and then based on those patterns that are matched, do something interesting with them, which is like um, run aggregate functions or window functions or simple counts, right? So you can define, I won't go into the details of the syntax, but you can define um, pass through the database and identify in this case three sessions in which um, users landed and made a purchase before, um, before they left within four, um, four visits. And here's the, the result for that, right? Session 100 did, they went on the landing page, the wine page, checkout page, um, and then et cetera. So this is a way, this is not a predictive algorithm, but it's an interesting tool for extracting patterns um, within, within tables. Okay. Um, so in the interest of time, I won't go through the, uh, the R interface. There is, um, there is an R interface as well that's kind of analogous to SQL in which all the heavy lifting is sort of done in the database. So it's an R client it's called Pivotal R. Um, but I want to talk very briefly about maybe what's coming up, right? So the next release is uh, coming up probably within a month or so. It's 1.10. Here are some of the work that's in it. The first implementation of mini-batching, which was referred to earlier, is in there for multi-class support vector machines. We've started work on graph. So some of the early graph um, algorithms are going to start to show up. Single source, shortest path, connected components. Um, we want to spend, we don't want to just build new stuff, we want to spend time improving the existing software as well. So there's a bunch of improvements to existing algorithms, including encoding of categorical variables, which is something that's like a really important utility for, um, for data scientists. And kind of looking further ahead, the things that I think are interesting that I've heard from the community, um, doing a lot more with graph, we have a lot of interest from people, especially in security analytics recently, I've heard, uh, in cybersecurity, who use graph very extensively. So, um, you know, to the extent that we can add useful graph algorithms within MATLAB, that would be very useful to them. Uh, we've started some initial work on deep learning and uh, neural nets. So the kind of ideas there are, are nascent. I would invite people who are interested in that to get involved in the, the discussions. Uh, we're thinking about things like incorporating uh, TensorFlow into MATLAB and also to support GPUs. So this would take advantage of some of the, the mini-batching work that's being done right now. We recently did a user survey, the most requested new algorithm with gradient-boosted machines, which is an um, ensemble algorithm often used with decision trees in, in order to do, um, and other weak learners, in order to get good models from multiple underlying models. Uh, more tools and, and such. So, um, yeah, finally, we're an Apache project incubating right now, planning hopefully to move to top level status um, within the next couple of months, although we'll see how that goes, because we've, we've done three uh, incubating releases so far. And I would certainly welcome folks from Postgres community uh, to, to join. You don't need to know a lot about data science because a lot of the work <clears throat> is, is not necessarily data science based. You don't have to know about convex optimization. A lot of the utilities, we get really great um, comments on the pull requests from people who have strong SQL skills, people from Postgres community. That adds a lot of value to the, um, to the project. So you're mo more than, than welcome to, to join and participate. And that was all I had. Thank you very much for your time. I don't know if we have any time for questions. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Yes. Can you 
Well, I'd say there's two components. One is moving the data. There's a cost associated with moving the data. And also, um, computation and Python library like scikit-learn, if, I guess if it's small enough, then yeah, it will run. But large data sets will run out of mem memory in Python libraries. Um, but um, like assuming, like if you compare some of the run times with like just R or PLR, for small data sets, it will probably run faster in R. In fact, it will. Because Madlib has overhead associated with it, um, designed for large data sets. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> you know, we, <clears throat> we do have people come to us and say, hey, I just ran this uh, data in R or scikit-learn and it runs a lot faster than in my you know, 16 node Greenplum cluster. And that's true probably, but Madlib wasn't designed for that small data. It was designed for the large data to run where scikit-learn um, perhaps can't. Yes? As a Postgres extension, um, well, <clears throat> it's on PGXN right now, um, if that's what you mean. Do you mean contributing it to Postgres core, or? So, so uh, just to mark the screen, that can be an extension, but it's actually a Postgres extension. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it is a Postgres extension. It's on PGXN, you can, you can get it from there. Right. Yeah, it's similar to PostGIS, I would say, in that respect, yeah. yeah. Question, yeah. Uh, on what is SciCast, uh, on what is SciCast, people usually are already using the Alchemical Development Lab and And then, it seems to me, the number of methods that we usually use on the mental stage is uh, too small. Oh, you mean for the, the examples that we showed? Uh, yes. Uh, no. uh, you uh, introduced uh, decent results about uh, 100 million. 100 million, yeah. Uh, it seems uh, uh, we usually have some sort of thing about uh, Postgres DL. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, those, those charts are for like relative performance, but wouldn't necessarily mean those are the data sizes you would use on MPP architecture. Yeah, um, I don't know. I mean, if you're, I don't know what they would be. I guess it depends on, um, you know, what those tables, tables look like. But, um, you know, Apache Madlib users tend to operate on large data sets, like in the billions of rows is common. I don't know exactly what the threshold is, though. Yeah. Question? Yeah. Um, there's, I would say that's a gap, if you will, here, that there's, there could be more. Like Greenblum Database has some basic gap filling tools. Um, Madlib, Madlib doesn't have any built in, in uh, tools for that. However, as <clears throat> I mentioned the survey that we did recently, that was one of the things that was requested in the survey. Uh, more tools for kind of inferring uh, where, there's, where there's gaps in the data for making good decisions about filling those gaps. So I think there's opportunity there. If somebody in the room has ideas about that, then um, be very interested to, to hear about it. Yes? Um, there's a, yeah, there, there is a nearest neighbor, um, algorithm which is in work right now. Yeah, I'm not sure it's on, you can check the mailing list just in the last day or two, somebody from University of Florida 
posted something on a proposed um, nearest neighbors algorithm. I haven't had a chance to look at it yet. Um, Spotify has one? Oh. Oh, OK. It's in C sharp right now. Uh, well, you know, I'll have a look at that. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the pointer. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>